Hello, bonjour, bienvenue, uh, welcome. If you're looking for the session that's about children learning and teachers teaching, you're in the right place. So um, I want to just suggest before we get started that what brings us all here today, of course, is education. But what I mean by that is I imagine each of us in this room at some point had a really special learning experience, something that changed us forever, something that changed our journey in this world. So if we take a moment just to think about that moment for each of us, that moment of learning, and then imagine if it had never happened. So education cannot wait is all about children who are excluded from moments of learning like this. And we know that anytime we're talking about excluded children, children with disabilities are in that group. And in fact, children with disabilities, when compared to their peers without disabilities, children with disabilities are 49 times more likely to never have attended school. So my name is Katie Holland. I'm from the Perkins School for the Blind. We've been unlocking learning for children with disabilities for 200 years. And I'm very happy to be your moderator today for this fantastic panel. Our goal today is to share the journey of a child with disabilities through learning in emergency settings. And if we do our job well, we hope that you'll all leave this room ready to take some action. So we're going to start um, by hearing from our friend Bernice Nsengyumva. Unfortunately, Bernice was not able to be with us in person today. So she sent a video. Bonjour à tous. Je m'appelle Bernice Nsengyumva. Je suis une fille burundaise vivant avec un handicap. Je suis désolée de ne pas voir arriver au Genève. Genève pour la référence, c'est pas ma volonté, c'est un manque de, de, de visa. Mais je vais vous partager les points principaux. Éducation chez les enfants handicapés au Burundi. Bien que le Burundi se soit aligné à l'agenda 2030, son aspect, sous son aspect promotion de l'action, une éducation de qualité et pour tous sur un pied l'égalité au DD4 pour nourrir ces personnes pour compte. Le niveau à la scolarisation est encore petit voire insignifiant pour les enfants vivant avec handicap. Et, et il y a les réseaux sera sont multiples, les, les faibles considérations de l'enfant handicapé et par rapport aux, aux autres membres de la famille, et, et des préjugés sur la capacité de l'enfant handicapé et suivre euh, la scolarisation comme les, les autres enfants. Et quand l'enfant handicapé est inscrit euh, à, à l'école, il n'est pas bien accueilli euh, comme les, ses collègues euh, et écoliers ou pas les, les éducateurs. Et euh, souvent, le milieu scolaire n'est pas euh, préparé euh, pour l'accueil des enfants handicapés et dans les diversité, euh, comme les soudés, les, euh, et les aveugles, euh, les maroubaïas et les déficiences motrices, et comme euh, les, les déficiences euh, et mentales et, ou intellectuelles. Et, Et, et tout de suite. Et il y a et, des obstacles communi euh, communicationnels ou physiques ou encore des problèmes socio-critiques et, euh, et constituent des barrières à l'accès à, euh, à la scolarisation des enfants handicapés. Et manque des outils pédagogiques comme et, les, les papiers brillants, et une tablette, les infractiles. Et, Et il est insuffisant des, des enseignants formés en langue de signes et, et en écriture bien. Cette éducation est, doit être inclusive pour permettre à tous les enfants 
euh, des pays acquéris, euh, des connaissances et de savoir et de savoir faire et sans ni discrimination ni euh, ségrégation. Car l'éducation inclusive favorise l'égalité des droits et des chances. Notre pays est touché par le changement climatique, c'est tout l'inondation. Et ce sont les personnes handicapées qui sont les plus touchées par rapport aux autres. Euh, euh, par exemple, euh, incapable de, de, de euh, par exemple, euh, manque de béquilles, euh, manque de chaises roulantes. Euh, euh, les sites de déplacement ne sont pas adaptés aux, aux autres personnes handicapées. Surtout les enfants pauvres, donc il euh, donc c'était difficile de continuer le corps à, à cause de, de l'inondation des familles euh, ont déménagé. Beaucoup de, de personnes vivant avec handicap ont tout perdu, comme les, les prothèses, les béquilles, et, et les cannes et les chaises roulantes. Ah, Donc oui. euh, dans votre pro, projet futur, euh, euh, surtout dans l'éducation qui nous et prier d'inclure les besoins euh, des enfants vivants, handicapés, c'est tout au Burund. Toute personne qui, euh, toute personne qui, qui peut contribuer pour le, le bien-être d'un enfant vivant avec un handicap peut aider à travers les associations des personnes handicapées au Burundi. Sensibiliser les familles euh, dans la campagne en général et les familles qui ont des enfants vivant avec un handicap, euh, en particulier sur l'importance à mettre son enfant vivant avec un handicap euh, dans l'école, euh, faire comprendre les enfants en général et les enfants vivant avec un handicap euh, particulier, l'importance de l'école. Et, et que ce que l'avenir du monde qui doit travailler dur pour ça. Et merci à tout le monde, je vous souhaite un bon séjour au Genève et merci. So, Bernice is the um, disability and gender equality advocate for the International Disability Alliance. Um, and she's coming in the video to us from her home office in Burundi where she's wearing a, a red shirt and looking both very professional and, and very um, happy. And she has a beautiful smile at the end. We're gonna also try as a panel to, to describe a bit how the setting is and how we look. So um, I mentioned I'm Katie Holland from the Perkins School for the Blind. I'm wearing a black jacket and a green scarf, which is my favorite color. To my right is Sandrine Bohanjako from Humanity and Inclusion. And Sandrine will be our next panelist. Welcome, Sandrine. Thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, good morning, everybody. So my name is Sandrine, and I'm a black woman uh, turning 50 this year, wearing also a black suit and a striped shirt. Uh, today, um, I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to share with you uh, one story. <laughs> uh, so also, I'm here, could not join us. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the life of uh, Amir. So you can see his picture um, on the screen. Uh, he's uh, working with a, with a therapist uh, on the picture, uh, trying to sort out some uh, little pictures. Um, so Amir is a nine years old boy. He's living in a slum in Beirut. He enjoys really going to school. He was born with muscle weakness and severe vision impairments. Amir also experiences unbalanced walking, difficulties to speak, concentrate, and memorize. His twin sister has a vision impairment too, and his elder brother also has a disability. The deteriorating economic crisis caused Amir, father, to close his coal shop. Amir's family got into debt in order to register their children at private school. This is because the schools in the area do not accept children with disabilities. The continuation of their education is uncertain. As Amir's mother says, we have 20 million Lebanese pounds, that is more than $13,000 in debt due to school fees. And we don't know how to repay this amount or what to do for the next school year. 
Before enrolling in private school, Amir's education was interrupted for three consecutive years. Due to the expensive schools and transportation fees, Amir was taken out of school in order to give the existing resources to his siblings' education and to meet other basic needs, like the provision of medication for both him and his brother. During the school closure caused by COVID-19 pandemic response, Amir did not have the access to online learning as his family could not afford the necessary devices. In addition, the continued cut power of power and electricity made remote learning even more complicated. All these factors exacerbated Amir's feeling of being left behind. And he asks, why am, I, why, why am I not like my sister? She can play, she doesn't feel the pain, and she always goes to school. So fortunately, Amir received some support from humanity and inclusion rehabilitation specialist who has facilitated his return to school. And he says, I really like to go to school and I don't want to stay at home anymore. This is the story of Amir, and this is just one among so many. Um, just to give you a couple of, of facts, uh, children with disability uh, in Lebanon represent only 0.5% of the school population. And there are only 1% of them who learn in a mainstream school, because it's all segregated school over there. With the crisis that they are facing in Lebanon right now, 78% uh, of the population is estimated to live in poverty. And as usual, education is deprioritized and it really affects in particular girls, children from Syria and children with disabilities. I could, I could also say a lot uh, about the COVID, but really it, it affected their capacity to learn because uh, like we said in another side event, it's not because there is digitalization or there are some uh, ICT activities that they are accessible to children with disabilities. So the one in Lebanon were not accessible to most of children with disabilities. So there's no fatality in life, I don't believe so. Um, so you may, you may both want to learn about some other stories. Uh, we have a really nice fact sheet, and you can learn about the story from other children, from Allah, from Sharif, um, and several other. We have some nice QR code that you can use to download it directly that we will make available. And you will find uh, also some really nice solution and recommendation uh, that are provided by um, by all the network, including uh, IDA, IDDC, and um, GCE, uh, with all sorts of recommendations on how to make a education more inclusive. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sandrine. Um, we are, as I said at the beginning, our goal in this session is to really share the journey of a child. I think we've spent a lot of time yesterday talking about policies and guidelines, but thank you so much for sharing that story. Our next speakers will be Nicola Banks and Josephine Al Haddad from Action for Humanity and World Vision, respectively. And we're going to hear a little bit more about um, Lebanon and also Syria. Over to you. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Nicola Banks. I am blonde and I'm wearing a green jacket. So I was originally here to speak about a report that we'd worked on together over the last few months, which looked at the relationship between access to inclusive education and child protection risks, uh, like child marriage and child labor and others um, in Northwest Syria and in Lebanon. Um, I'm from Action for Humanity. We have some of the biggest schools programs in Northwest Syria. So my colleagues who unfortunately couldn't be here today um, are experts in education in emergencies. Um, but given the devastating earthquakes that occurred last week, um, the topic of the, of the discussion that I'll be talking about has shifted slightly. Um, I am not talking, I'm now talking about a very present emergency. And we're beginning to look at how these past lessons can shape the emergency response in this crisis. Um, so here on your screen, actually, this is one of Action for Humanity's schools. 
Um, and as you can see, um, it's been re repurposed as a as a shelter. So as well as the um, delays to returning to education in northwest Syria, this is this will be one of them, the fact that the space is being used for shelter. Um, so we're particularly concerned about the impact of the earthquake on child protection um, of, of Syrian children and youth, um, particularly with disabilities who have already been negatively impacted by ongoing conflict and are facing increasing risks. Um, before this emergency, the research that I mentioned before, um, it showed that children with disabilities are at a higher risk of exploitation, abuse and neglect. Um, with only 44% of children with disabilities between the age of 12 and 17 in Syria having access to school. Our study showed that children with disabilities face multiple barriers when accessing school. Um, so things like geographic distance, lack of inclusive classrooms or teachers without adequate training. Um, and they also cited things like peer bullying, street harassment and sexual harassment as key barriers to accessing education um, which all obviously need to be addressed as we seek to build back education systems but the importance of education was recognized significantly in these communities in northwest syria and this research took place this year so it's 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 recent very recent this study showed that people in northwest syria believe that if their children with disabilities could go to school, it would provide greater protection from harm. In fact, 70 out of 72 respondents strongly agreed that children with disabilities would be less likely to experience child labour if they could go to school. And 67 out of 72 said that children with disabilities would be less likely to experience child marriage if they could go to school. Availability of inclusive education for girls with disabilities would even was even believed to delay their potential exposure to child marriage by up to five years, which is significant. The majority, which is 36 percent of respondents, think that it could delay child marriage for girls with disabilities for five years. A key theme that has really stood out for me in this conference has been from you know from education advocates people in this room has been the idea that inclusive education is a negotiation it's constantly that we need to negotiate right so and it is it is i think it is true um so in the study parents and caregivers discuss that they need to compromise in the with this so you know they need to make the compromise between education and food financial difficulty was a key barrier for their children with disabilities to access education in northwest Syria. Um, and our study unfortunately did find that children as young as five with disabilities were engaging in, in you know, street labour. And again, this is recent. Um, on the programme side of things, with the current emergency, education is often the first to be compromised and the last to resume in an emergency response. Um, again, but again, what I come back to is this, that education is highly valued by the community itself and was perceived to add a layer of protection to children with disabilities if the barriers were just removed. So we just need to remove, to re remove the barriers. We need to see investment in edu inclusive education. We need to see disability mainstreamed into wider programs and we need to break down the stigma that's associated with disability and I'm summarizing it and making it sound very easy. Um, but the demand for education is clear and the community believe that it adds a layer of protection, we just need to make sure it happens. Hello everyone, I'm Josephine Haddad from World Vision Lebanon. Um, I have black hair and I'm wearing white and black. So basically to build on what Nicola said and what Sandrine said about the situation of children with disabilities in Lebanon, I will give you a brief overview of the situation of education in Lebanon. Um, since 2019, Lebanon has been assailed by one crisis after the other. Uh, severe political instability, the Beirut blast, COVID-19, 
the economic crisis, the worst economic crisis in the country's history, and most recently, a cholera outbreak. Um, among the repercussions to the crisis, the education sector took a very big hit. Currently, an estimated one million children are out of school in Lebanon for two reasons. One, an increased or a spike in the dropout rate in schools and enrollment this year because parents cannot afford to pay tuitions, and if they can afford to pay tuitions, they cannot afford to pay for transportation and other supplies. The second reason is that public school teachers are striking due to low uh, pay, and there was a suspension in the uh, uh, afternoon shifts attended by Syrian refugees, and I didn't mention that Lebanon has the highest concentration of refugees per capita with 1.5 million Syrian refugees and an estimated half a million Palestinian refugee in Lebanon. Um, we looked at the situation of vulnerable children in education in Lebanon, among them children with disabilities, refugee children with disabilities. And 70% of these children are not attending schools. 21% are in primary schools, and only 7% are in intermediary schools. What are the barriers? The barriers are school tuition and school fees, inaccessible classrooms, bullying and stigma, and inaccessible schools. And the other barriers that these children are facing are definitely stigma. So the highest percentage uh, with what the respondent said was bullying and stigma. So despite 70% of the children uh, who were interviewed and their parents are not going to school, none of them, almost none of them, were engaged in child labor and early marriage. So around stigmas and lack of inclusion in uh, social activities and discrimination and, all, and uh, the lack of access to schools, we interviewed two caregivers, two parents, to understand the situation in the household. Both Fatima and Noura, they have other children engaged in child labor. They have children who are uh, engaged in early marriage, but their children with disabilities aren't because most of the uh, uh, caregivers, they believe that their, their children are unable to manage work-related chores or uh, household-related um, or uh, uh, household-related responsibilities. So in conclusion, refugee children with disabilities in Lebanon are suffering from lack of access to education, from stigma, and from other child protection risks. Thank you so much, Nicola and Josephine, for, for helping us understand some of the very practical barriers that children face and how it, it plays out in their everyday lives. Our next speaker um, is Nafisa Babu from Light for the World. And uh, Nafisa, I'm looking forward to your remarks. I know you're also sharing some thoughts from a colleague of yours. So please, over to you. Thank you, Katie. So I am a brown woman of color. Um, I have short hair and, um, and a big smile on my face because I'm really happy to be here. Um, and dimples, which I think one day someone once said to me that oh, those are, that's a, a defect. And I thought, oh no, not another thing that's wrong with me. Because I'm actually, I, I have a visual impairment. And it was something I was actually teased about a lot when I was at school. But today I'm going to tell you about South Sudan. It's a country that holds a very special place in my heart. Almost a decade ago, when I interviewed for the lead position uh, in education at Light for the World, they asked me, why do you want this job? And the answer came very quickly to me. I really wanted to be part of the team supporting the country, the youngest nation on my continent, to build an inclusive education system from the ground up. There was no special schools there uh, where children could be pushed off to. Um, and it was really a place where I could see that children with and without disabilities learning together. So I've been to South Sudan many, many times. Um, and I always feel the excitement and the hope of people, and being particular, young people with disabilities. When visiting schools, I remember uh, parents and teachers were asking us to help them solve this mysterious condition called nodding disease. And, then we, and we've been supporting them in that. 
I remember hearing from parents the challenges they experienced walking for kilometers and kilometers to find a safe place um, during the time of civil war, which still goes on, and their fears and their challenges. So peace is fragile in South Sudan, but the hope and the energy of young people is undisputable. They are they are there, they, they are there to dream of a better future, they're ready and they are able and to want, they want to contribute to building an inclusive South Sudan. So that's really awesome. So let me tell you about one of the amazing young people there. Um, Abila is one of 60 disability inclusion facilitators. He is a young blind qualified teacher with and he has undergone six months of training on uh, and mentorship. And after this, he's been supporting humanitarian organizations working in education emergencies in the IDP camps. So he's helping them to make sure that their education programs are disability inclusive. He uses his personal and professional experience to give pragmatic advice, right? And walk the journey with people and schools. And one of those students he helps support is Nadia, the young girl in the picture over there. So she's 12 years old and in class three, and she has cerebral palsy and a visual impairment. So Abilio 3's networking has helped to link her mother with a village savings and loan scheme, and she has had some additional some training and making homemade liquid soap. And now she really has a thriving business that helps her to pay for her daughter's education and for them to have a good life. So now, no longer are they stigmatized in their community, but they are seen as valuable contributors. To Nadia and her mother, Abilo is a really a role model. He, is, he has a great job, he's respected, and he's married and has a lovely family. So there are many, many other amazing disability inclusion facilitators in South Sudan that I would like to pay homage to. They do amazing things like radio shows and trainings. And um, one of the people there is my colleague, Sophia Mohammed, who is the country director. They are always ever ready to learn and co-design toolkits with me and the team and also deliver training. One of them that we are launching this year is one on inclusive education management information systems. And we are also developing one on inclusive play this year. So organizations like Light for the World and organizations of persons with disabilities have been working very diligently with DG Esther um, and her colleagues in the Ministry of Education to develop an inclusive education policy and strategy that has been also incorporated in the new education sector plan. So, you know, the road ahead is clear for us and the rural, the political wall is truly there. But what is really needed is the financial investment. Investments that will ensure that children with disabilities are meaningfully included in each and every educational program. There are many, many budding nation builders like Abilo, like Nadia and her mother. At least, you know what we really want to see is at least 60% of at least 5% of all education funding should be allocated to building an inclusive education system and also address the specific needs of children with disabilities. We really need to make sure that funding is mandatory, is that funding really looks and supports students with disabilities, any funding to education. But this is our call to action that we developed with um, the Global Campaign for Education, the International Disability Alliance, and the um, International Disability and Development Consortium. And we're really, really proud that Education Cannot Wait has been making commendable progress in answering this call to action. So we want to encourage you to please sign it. And more importantly, ask donors to step up the action and support the development of a just and peaceful society where no one is left behind. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nafisa. Um, I think we, we, I told you we were gonna hope that at the end of the session, you wanna leave and take some action. And that's just one way to do it. 
Um, I think it's also we were we were talking before the session with some colleagues that it's important to understand that that there's different disabilities. And, and the experience of children, for example, with sensory disabilities or developmental disabilities may be different from those with other physical disabilities. And so really getting into the nuts and bolts of some of the trainings and toolkits you talked about, Nafisa, helps us really get to the experience of, of these children. Our final um, panelist today is um, Bambos Haralambos, who is a member of parliament from the UK. And I, Bambos, I'd like to invite you to share some reflections on the panel today. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Katie. Uh, I'm uh, Bambos Haralambos. I'm the uh, Member of Parliament in the UK Parliament. Uh, I'm wearing a grey suit with a, uh, a red tie, and I'm sitting at the very uh, end of the, um, the panel. Um, so just to draw on some of the uh, reflections that we've had today, some of the comments we've had, um, a, a point that Katie made was that uh, children with disabilities are 49% more likely not to have attended school, which obviously has a huge impact on um, their ability to progress in life in the way that other children would do. Uh, we heard from Bernice. Uh, Bernice mentioned the um, um, the issues that um, the issues that people face, uh, particularly in Burundi, where um, you have. Um, low consideration, you have stigma, you have uh, lack of preparation by educators, you have physical barriers, um, and there was a real need to raise awareness. Uh, these are issues that other speakers also raised, and uh, uh, there's a, a theme that's emerging from um, today about those problems that uh, exist. We heard from Sandrine, who told the story about uh, Mir in Lebanon, uh, and again about the impact of the uh, uh, economic crash in Lebanon. Um, and how um, only 1% of children with disabilities were in mainstream school. Uh, again, that's another uh, theme that emerges, the lack, of, um, the lack of provision in mainstream schools to cater for uh, children with disabilities. Um, we heard from, um, from Nikki about the, uh, the access in uh, emergency, uh, um, education emergency areas about the, north, the, the earthquake in northwest Syria. Uh, and about the risk of children being with disabilities being exploited. Um, so there's, um, uh, and obviously how valued uh, education is in those uh, areas as well. Um, and uh, how people saw that uh, having somebody who was educated, having a child who was educated would actually provide protection um, against the exploitation. Uh, and Nikki particularly focused on um, the, um, um, about children being forced into child marriage. So that's also a factor that uh, the uh, having education would also protect against. Uh, also from Josie, uh, Josie mentioned uh, again an overview of the crisis in Lebanon uh, and about the one million children being uh, out of school. Um, and uh, the other barriers that parents face, uh, issues around uh, not, being able to, not being able to afford to go to school because not being able to afford the tuition fees and not being able to afford the transportation and also the stigma. And uh, she gave the, the two accounts from uh, Fatima and uh, Nora about um, what their experience was as parents. And uh, lastly, we also heard from uh, Nafisa who um, um, gave a wonderful account of um, how um, disability inclusive educators uh, can um, can help with uh, children and it can be a virtuous circle in the way they can uh, support children and also their parents uh, in being economically active, which also is something that will overcome um, the problems that uh, also prevent children from going to school. So some things to draw on and these can be questions for uh, discussion when we have our Q&A shortly. So one of them is um, looking at sort of the um, there's a need for greater funding for children uh, in education. So how does the um, how do the promises, how do the pledges that have been made at this conference, uh, bear in mind that it's uh, about 25% of what we really need for all children. Uh, how will that impact on the children with uh, disabilities uh, in getting the, the education that they need um, when it's not even enough for what's being asked for. So what, what does that mean? Uh, what does the funding issue mean? Uh, we also need to look at um, um, the 
it's, it's been mentioned in passing, but the intersectional needs of children. So we know that girls are very vulnerable. Uh, girls with disabilities will be even more vulnerable. What does that mean? So I think that there's also needs to, to look at that. Um, also, it's been touched on, but looking at twin track approach around inclusive education. So um, want to see what provision can be made in the mainstream, um, but also um, the targeted support that's needed for children as well. So what targeted support can also be provided as well as long alongside the mainstream. And I think the um, another point we need to look at is what are the clear actions that we want um, politicians um, and NGOs to be taking uh, to help make sure that inclusive children uh, are not left behind. Uh, because clearly uh, SDG 4 is all about not leaving anyone behind. So these are just some of the themes that I think we should be focusing on and need to like um, post questions about. Um, I'll leave it there because I, I want to allow enough time for Q&As, but those are just some of the sort of the thoughts we need to be thinking about. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Thanks so much, Bambos. And before we, we do have an open up discussion, I want to thank, um, first of all, our interpreters. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you. And also Techo Danso, who is our, our brave rapporteur for this session back there. Um, so we, we have a, a couple pre-positioned discussions to get the conversation going. Um, the first one is Dr. Maha Kochen Bagshaw, who's the Inclusive Education Advisor here at Education Cannot Wait. Maha, please, welcome. Okay, can, can you hear me? Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation to contribute to this session. I'm so delighted to be here. Um, just to describe myself, like anyone, uh, all of you have done, um, I have Middle Eastern look because of my origin. I'm originally from Lebanon. And uh, before I start, I really can't agree more with uh, Josephine. Sorry. Yeah, uh, I think I'm one of the people who, if I haven't had the chance to travel and study abroad, I'm not sure what kind of education I would have received in Lebanon because of the many issues that both of our colleagues described happening in Lebanon, which is similar to so many other countries across the world, uh, mainly in emergency and protracted crisis. I'm, I'm really so delighted to, to observe the growing interest in inclusive education generally and the inclusion of persons with disabilities in particular. We really have come a long way in terms of availability of legislations, programs and initiatives, and most importantly, uh, interest and commitments um, uh, to move forward with inclusive education, whether on a local level, on a national level, or on a global level. Equity and inclusion at Education Cannot Wait are central to our work internally and also through our investments and uh, partnerships. This commitment is reflected in our accountability framework on disability and also in our strategic plan 2023 and 2026. <laughs> Education Cannot Wait is committed to reaching 10% of persons with disabilities across the different investment windows through ensuring that our investments allow access, participation and achievements of persons with disabilities and our and uh, our investments also consider identifying and remo removing barriers facing the inclusion of persons with disabilities. Education Cannot Wait is also committed to supporting initiatives that mainstream disabilities and also support targeted interventions to ensure the fair and meaningful inclusion of persons with disabilities. We are also committed to engaging with persons with disabilities and their organizations as partners and contributors to the design, implementation, monitoring and evaluation of our programs. This commitment we have renewed it recently by signing the test call to action on disability inclusive education. And this is to further emphasize our realization to the rights of children and adults, including those with diverse disabilities in emergencies and protracted crises. 
and quality inclusive education. <sighs> Progress has been made, but there's still a lot that needs to be done to reach out to all persons with disabilities. And we collectively must do much more to ensure that nobody is left behind. So I will leave it there. And thank you so much for inviting me to speak. Happy to answer any question afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Maha. We have just a few minutes left. Um, that I wanted to invite another friend, um, Esther Akumu, the Director General for Gender Equity, e Equity and Inclusive Education, which I think is one of the best job titles I've ever heard, um, in the Ministry of Education in South Sudan. Esther, welcome. Thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, it's actually a great opportunity for me to be here in this uh, very important uh, conference. And uh, as uh, Nafisa have said it, I think uh, there's a lot to be done still in South Sudan. South Sudan have only recently started to recognize the children with disability. And uh, we had only one center where we have those of Abilo coming from, the, the, the Center for Visual Empire which was one time established by the Norwegian. And uh, since then, we never had any other center. It's the only center where these child learners with the visual impairment go to school, come back to that center in order to have their lessons or uh, their, their notes transcribed into Braille so that they can read. So, we had recently developed the policy, which we launched last year in 2021, July. And now together with Light for the World and other partners, we are trying to have to make sure that we develop a strategy. And in fact, in South Sudan, we have a big problem with these learners with disability. Why? Because we don't have the teaching and the learning materials for these children, especially when you look at the children who are visually impaired. They don't have the brain, not even the stylus. If it is there, it is only in one center, but the whole country where we have children who are hidden, who are not even brought out because many people in our country think that having a child with disability is a curse. So, they they don't want to expose them and they keep them in hiding but with this policy that we developed recently we have started disseminating and uh, creating awareness to the community and uh, even with the support from other partners we have the wheelchairs now that we are able to distribute to the learners and the children have started to come to school so we feel that if we are able to have at least the resource centers in each part of the country where we can get these children who needed real support to be supported, where we have the teachers trained, because another major problem is the teacher training. If you don't have two teachers who are trained, then you will not be able to support these learners with disability. And uh, we are working hard on this with the Light for the World and uh, also Leonard Chesha used to help us in that area to make sure that the teachers are trained at least how to handle the learners with disability. We have gone through and uh, trying to see also how we can support these learners, especially now that some parts of the country is flooded you find that these are the children who will not have the opportunity to go to school. We have at least 2.8 learners, uh, 2.8 children who are out of school. And out of this 2.8, two thirds are girls and children with disability. So it's a big number that we needed to get out and bring them on board to be counted also. 
And in fact, in the past, we didn't have even the data for the children with disability. But now with the support that we have, we have developed a column for the learners with disability because we needed now to see to it that they are brought on board and to know the condition. And through this, now we have developed a design way of uh, the infrastructure, which should be at least inclusive, where a child with disability can move on the wheelchair and even can go to the toilet or washroom without any difficulties, which was not there before. But now we are trying to have that, that is still at a low or uh, very few schools are having that. And we are trying to ensure that at least we have to have the, the schools conducive for all the learners in the area. So if we could have the resource centers and uh, collaborate with the health ministry of health ministry of gender in order to see to it that the identification of some of this disability at the early stage is done, then we could always protect more children or more, yeah, more children from having some disabilities. Because we know that disabilities, some are just not born with, but it comes on, but and it can be prevented. So these are the things that we are looking at, and we are trying very much to work with our partners like uh, Light for the World. Humanity Inclusion have come up. We are happy, and we hope that through them we shall work hard to transcribe even the curriculum into brain such that we can have a real inclusive education that we aspire. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I'm afraid we're out of time. Um, however, I promised you this was the session where we would talk about children learning and teachers teaching. So thank you for sharing how that looks in South Sudan. And I hope that we can all leave this room ready to take some action so that every child can have one of those moments of learning that really changes them forever. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of the day. I have a couple of copies from the report and from the call to action. So feel free to come and take one.